Great, uh, we have some new microphone system which we're adapting to. Um, I want to welcome everyone to a uh, Tuckahoe Zoning Board, Village of Tuckahoe Zoning Board special meeting of Wednesday, August 6th, 2014. And uh, what I'm first going to do is, uh, do we do the, the roll first? Okay, so please Nancy call the roll. Member Scalzo. Present. Member Palladino. Present. Present, thank you. And uh, uh, Member DeSalvo uh, sends his regrets and he's not able to make it tonight, um, but uh, it this was a last minute meeting. Uh, first, I want to do a Pledge of Allegiance. Everyone would stand, please. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. And uh, you know, I think we're all a little rusty. Uh, zoning board hasn't met in quite some time, so we'll try and uh, get through everything. Um, first, for the uh, the public, uh, the first item is a 125 Marbledale, which is being adjourned until the next meeting. Want the uh, public to understand that we, uh, the applicant, uh, both the landlord and the applicant, did come to the work session. There was some questions as to uh, the uh, validity or deficiency in the notice, uh, which is going to be uh, re re repaired. But it was a it was a it was a good meeting. Um, we learned a lot about the applicant, so the public knows. It did not come across as uh, what we originally thought, and it's something that uh, if the applicant and the landlord can. Uh, work with the building department and the village attorney. It might be something that, uh, you know, may be outside of what we originally thought in a pure auto body. So we do have an open mind to it. It uh, appears to be uh, possibly semi-retail, which could benefit everybody on uh, the block. And we're optimistic because this is a board that uh, desperately wants to work with all applications and, uh, and are very always concerned about landlords and uh, their vacancies and understand the hardship that that uh, does imply and uh, we, we we're going to do our best and both the village attorney and the uh, building department we will be working with it and hopefully we'll have more information for the public in our uh, september meeting um is anybody want to any members before i move on to the next one want to make a comment about marbledale road the body shop Okay, hearing none, then what we're going to do is we're going to call up 109 Marbledale Road, the area variance for the construction of a hotel. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm Rocco Salerno, attorney for the applicant, Billwin Development, which proposes to construct a Marriott Hotel and restaurant on the property located at 109 Marbledale Road. The property consists of approximately 150,000 square feet, of vacant land in the general commercial district and is designated as section 35 block one, lot 1A on the official tax map. With me this evening are Bill Weinberg, a principal of Bill Wind uh, Development and Gary Washauer, the project architect. Uh, before I go through the uh, five prong test for the area variance, I surrender the floor to Mr. Washauer who will uh, briefly describe the project to you. Thank you. Thank you, Rocco. Um, I, I just hold you off. In the microphone, no, yeah. Can you give him that one? Maybe that's portable, yeah. But do we have a camera? Where's a, do we have a, all right, so the, we can get the camera zoomed in on the, uh, the easel, please, for the public. June. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, my name is Gary Warshower. I'm a principal with the firm of Warshower and Malusi Warshower Architects, the architect for the project. Um, our proposal is for a Marriott Spring Hill Suites Hotel to be built on this um, 3.4 roughly acre um, property. Um, together with the hotel, we're also proposing a story. Yes. 
breaking in and out. A one-story, um, 6,400 square foot restaurant. Um, the site Jesus. site plan shows the uh, configuration. Oh boy! All right, let's try this one here. Yeah, let's just aim it towards you. Hit the button. Make sure the green light's on, please. Can we hear you? No. Nope. Try again. Hit the button. There you go. There now you're go. on. Okay. All right. Just see if, see if it picks up from that distance. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, because we get feedback. Um, uh, pursuant to the site plan. No. Maybe a little closer. Want me to stand over here? Uh, might be just grab it. Stand over here. How's that? Okay. Is that better? Yeah. That's good. Perfect. We can. The, the can TV looks good. And I presume people can see on the monitor. Yes, they got it. Good. Okay. Good. Um, thank you. Um, the site plan uh, shows uh, again the um, the site is about a 3.4 acre property located on Marbledale Road. Uh, we were proposing a five-story, 163-room um, hotel in the south uh, portion of the of the uh, site. I'm going to interrupt you. Yes. And so I would just do me one favor and point out the two existing properties that are in that photograph. So one would be uh, the Phoenix Fitness, and then the other one is the 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 warehouse. This is the warehouse that is currently there that people pass by all the time, and That's then. Correct. And that is the Phoenix Fitness. So this is so the public is fully understanding the land that surrounds these parcels, which they are most familiar with, and they vacant lot. If you're facing the land, that the hotels is to the left of the, the existing buildings. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Um, again, the the hotel is proposed to be five stories and 163 rooms. Um, located uh, in the portion of the site that is adjacent to um, a commercial zoning all around it. Um, access to the site off of Marbledale Road proposes to come in um, and out um, to allow for drop-off under a port cochere and the main entrance to the, to the hotel lobby, as well as access back into the parking area that serves uh, the hotel. There is a one-story portion of the hotel in, in the main lobby area that, in, that, in, that, in, um, that has the pool and a um, exercise area in it. Um, that portion uh, is um, located um, within the rear yard setback. And again, the variances that we're asking for tonight relate to a building setback and um, buffer, uh, buffer areas located along the west side, the back side of the property. Um, so that one portion of the building that comes out one story um, is within that setback um, and it is adjacent to an area of um, undeveloped naturally sloped um, property um, that is about 100 feet in depth and rises about 40 or more feet um, through its 100 foot length. Um, the other portion of the, of the project includes a one-story hotel which is located on the north end okay of the let's go a little slower um, uh, and, and again we're gonna, I think because of the size and the, and the, and the, the, the structure and the terminology here I want to go a little slower yes so what we're talking about here is a buffer zone and a buffer zone is basically the distance between the building and someone else's property that is correct okay so there's a certain amount of buffer zone that is required and would I be correct in stating that what you said is that the general five-story building, is that what you said? That is correct. That is within the legal buffer zone, correct? The building itself. The building itself is... The five-story building is within the buffer zone legal as of right? That is correct. The five-story portion of the building conforms to the setback. And the, the area setback. that is in question that you're coming to this board for is a pool, did you say? That is correct. It's the one-story portion that I'm outlining now. Uh -huh. That includes, and I can show you on the large plan. All right, but let's what just say where is, we but, are now. It's a it pool. Includes, it includes the pool and an exercise area. And it's only one story. It is only one story. And so you need relief from this board, not for the five story section, but for the one story section. That is correct. And the Thank relief is 
we're, the re we're asking for, the requirement is a 20-foot rear yard setback. We're proposing six feet. So the relief is, that's what the relief we're asking so for. So you need an extra six feet out of the 20? No, no, we need 14 feet of relief. You need 14 feet, so the building will be how many feet from the property? Six feet. Six feet. The now, one story portion. Okay. Who owns the property? Because I see a lot of houses. That doesn't look like six feet. The, the Do you understand my question? Yes. That six feet is what you need, but that looks like more than six feet to a house. Correct. But the zoning requirement is from the property line to the building. Yes. And even though this area behind that's shown undeveloped and is a sloping, naturally wooded When area. you say sloping, you mean slightly sloping, very high sloping? Steep, steeply sloping. Steeply sloping. This slopes about four, more than 40%. So it's sloping roughly 40 feet in 100 feet. Okay. From a low point here to a high point where these houses behind it. Okay, so you want to be six feet closer to the, to the other property owner's property, but that property is not developed. That is correct. It is a high rock wall. Would that be correct in saying similar? It is a, a steeply sloping rock wall. And does anybody have an idea of how far away that variance would still be from a residence? Mr. Williams, would you guesstimate? It looks to me like 50 feet plus the height. Am I wrong? I'm correct. Okay, so... Do you, do members like understand what I'm trying to, where, where I'm going here is that this isn't a situation where the applicant is asking us for a variance of six feet from the property line from someone's house. This is six feet from a rock wall, which still would not interfere, from what I can tell, with the quality of life of someone and where someone lives, additionally of the height. I just want to make sure I understand it because... I'm looking at a picture here that looks pretty far, and you're saying six feet, and I'm trying to get my arms around it. All right, thank you. Go ahead. Okay. The other, the other variance request, let me stay, stay with that, relates to the landscape buffer area that is required from within our property line. And again, that, that is, doesn't take into account the, the um, undeveloped landscape buffer that exists off our property which continues uh, throughout that whole west side of the property. Okay, um, I just wanted, so that I understand. The buffer, we still have further down where there's no structure. We have a buffer, and then there are houses that jet closer to the property in question. Correct. Okay, so that, where you had your fingers where I want you to stay. Okay. So now we have a buffer requirement of 20 feet, right? Yes, okay. So, and do we need a variance there also? Does the applicant need a variance yes. there? Yes, you need a variance there. Why? We need a variance on the buffer from this point going north on this west side uh, because the, the landscaped area on our property, particularly in the northernmost end because of the configuration of the property lines and the parking design, reduces to 8 feet when 20 feet is required. But it looks like it's wider. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I don't understand. Well, if you see the... That looks like the closest area there. Right here is... No. The, well, again, right yes. here is the, is the closest spot. And it's less than, it is less than 20 feet. And if you see the property line varies... The property line irregular. would be the top of the, the light green. Line, the property line, top of the light green is irregular. I see. And so with that irregularity, it varies from a little more than 20 feet to a minimum dimension of eight feet. Eight feet. Correct. So we're looking for 12 foot variance at the furthest most point. That is correct. Even with that house that looks further away? Yeah, it doesn't relate, it doesn't relate at all to the houses. The zoning relates only to the dimension oh, from oh, to our the property vacant. line, from our property line. And what is the difference in the steepness, if that's the cor correct word, the steepness down at the northern end? Um, is it as steep as the other or is it different? It is equally as steep. As a matter of fact, I think it's steeper as you go north. So it is the steeper. The dimension is, clo is closer, but it's about the same 30 or 40 feet of grade change. Even though it's only a 40 from the property line, it's only 30 or 40 feet to the houses. Okay. Plus so, the 15 or 20 feet on our side. 
I'm just going to stop here. I'm going to talk amongst my board. I mean, this is what's interesting I find about this is that we're dealing with a distance, but we're also dealing with a height. So when we're dealing with the impact, the detriment of a variance, we've always learned in our in our in our zoning classes is that we're we have to examine a detriment to the neighbors. So now we have a situation where, on paper, it looks reasonably close. But, and, and, and I say this again because I was at the property again today before this meeting and I walked the, the frontage again. Uh, there is a height um, situation here uh, which doesn't really come into the law. I don't think the law incorporates that, but it's something that may be something that the, the zoning board you know, can take into consideration. Is the height a factor, whether it's up or down, as a reference to the impact to the neighbors. And again, I, I, this is something that, you know, in my numerous times that I've walked the property, um, that I've tried to factor in, and now I'm getting a little, you know, better handle on it, but the height to me is something that uh, I will factor in, in, in my consideration of this. Does any other members have a question on to? There's, it looks like what they've done is designed the project so that where the building height would be at its greatest would be at a distance, further distance from all of the houses with the greatest distance between the hotel and the residences behind it. And as you move down, there are no buildings there. There's not going to be anything impacting. So what they're asking for is a gradual variance where there are no height. There's no height. There's no building. All that would impact those homes would be this green belt of plantings. So you're saying that the, the, the variance has nothing to do with structures? No. Visually or physically. Member Scalzo? Uh, Mr. Washar, thanks for your presentation. So it appears to me like you actually have a lot of space. You know, you've got 3.4 acres, as you, as you mentioned. And so it seems reasonable that you could have easily designed the whole thing to not need a single variance. But it also seems to me that you designed it to maximize parking. Um, and so if, for instance, at the north end, you wanted to be completely within variance, you could probably do that pretty easily, but you might eliminate four or five parking spots, ten parking spots, um, and you can kind of carry that through kind of for the whole thing. So it seems like you're trying to maximize the use of the space, maximize parking, which is always a big issue, um, and having minimal impact on the neighbors uh, next door. Um, is that is that correct? Is that some of the thinking that went into the site plan layout and the arc, you know? Yeah, I think the planning of the site was done in a way to meet the zoning requirements. So parking obviously is an issue, and we have a requirement for both the restaurant and for the hotel, and we meet both of those requirements independent of one another. Um, also, for the efficiency of the of the site planning. Um, we wanted to be able to mac plan the building, particularly the hotel, in such a way that we minimize impacts on adjacent properties and on adjacent residences. And as was pointed out, um, our main thinking was to, was to put the hotel, um, which is the tallest of the, of the development, in an area that has the largest setback and the biggest grade changes, uh, creating those buffers. Um, in terms of the efficiencies of the parking, we try to be very efficient with paving. Uh, singly loaded uh, parking is inefficient. It adds uh, pervious surfaces um, or impervious surfaces when we try to minimize impervious surfaces. Um, so we're, we try to do whatever we can in these layouts to uh, create the efficiency so that you don't pave any more than you have to. Um, and that is basically what this does. The other thing that we do is the planning of the parking, since it's in one integrated site between the restaurant and the hotel, um, this, 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 the parking is um, shared. The hotel parking actually comes back into this area of the site. The restaurant parking is, is sort of over on the north end. But the circulation of being able to have somebody come in and out in both locations to be able to circulate through the site is very important. Um, in order to get clean circulation. So that is in this area where you're talking about, we have that variance for the buffer area. By reducing that would um, somewhat impact um, that circulation. So that basically is our, is our planning. Any other questions? Yeah, I've got a go laundry list. And, and maybe um, 
Uh, this is for Mr. Weinberg as well. Um, uh, maybe, Mr. Weinberg, could you give a history of, um, of this project and how it came to be and why you selected Tuckahoe and, um, you know, how we got to this point? I, I, you know, as a member of the board and the community, we're very excited to have you guys just come and present. Uh, obviously, this has been vacant land for a long time, so even the fact that you're considering it, we really appreciate it. We know it takes a lot of money and time just to get to this point. Any microphone, sir? Or, or you can go to the podium or if you want. Whatever you're comfortable So I originally was going to do a very small development on this site and met Mayor Fitzpatrick and told him and he said, no, 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 we really need to have some kind of tax base in Tuckahoe. And we can't impact the schools at all because they're excellent schools, they're full, and we're rewriting the master plan and we did an analysis and we brought professionals in, we did a study and the highest and best use of the property with the least amount of impact on Tuckahoe and its schools and the highest tax revenue was a hotel. And I spoke to the hotel people and they weren't that enthusiastic in talking to me because I'd never built a hotel. So I partnered with the former CEO of Lowe's Hotels, Jack Adler, and all of a sudden he made it clear to them just how much of a lack of hotel rooms there are in southern Westchester. If you need to go to a hotel, you need to go to White Plains or Tarrytown or Nourishell or Yonkers, but really there's not enough hotel rooms. And we went on this path and Tuckahoe did write in hospitality as part of their master plan. And we think it's a great use without high traffic, which will definitely bring tax revenue and customers into Tuckahoe. We wanted a restaurant, but no one goes to a hotel restaurant, so we separated the restaurant that will service the hotel and the community and Westchester at large at the other end of the parking lot. And here we are. How did you, uh, can you talk about your relationship with Marriott and Spring Hill Suites? How did that come to be? And what type of um, agreements or relationship do you have at this point? Why, why this brand in Tuckahoe? Well, we commissioned HVS, who's a hotel consultant, the most respected, the most expensive in the industry. And they came up with Hilton and Marriott as the top two brands. And beforehand, they weren't interested in talking to me. But with the partner, they understood the demographics now and the real need for hotels. And the Spring Hill Suites is, during the week, a business person's hotel. It's not a suite. It's not a standard hotel. It's kind of a hybrid of the two. There's over 300 that are open presently. There's 99 more that are about to open shortly that have been built. There's 46,000 hotel rooms. There's never been a failed Spring Hill suite. They have a great return on investment. They're a reasonably priced hotel. They're run by Marriott, which is a Mormon family. They are very strict about what goes on in their hotels and how they do business. And they dictate to us every inch of how it operates. They select a chosen few management companies that I can pick from to manage the hotel and they all have great track records and experience with Marriott and they run a tight ship. Great and um, Spring Hill Suites are they generally uh, about 163 rooms this is uh, from from your plans you've designed something to be 163 rooms or have you had to significantly compromise the property based on our zoning laws or, or what's allowed there. Um, we're interested in seeing the highest and best use, but I want to, um, you know, what I want to understand from the architect and from you is even getting to this point, have you compromised on that plan? Or is this um, in what Marriott would do if there was no, no zoning ordinances, you know? Yes, we've adapted the plan to the site and the village and 163 rooms is the maximum that fits nicely on the site with very little variances and with very little impact on the neighbors. It will kind of blend in the height difference between the top of the hill or mountain behind us and the top of the hotel is very close. So it doesn't really impact anyone. Marbledale Road can certainly use an improvement. Our neighbors are, you know, one side a car parking lot for Smith Car and Ford and 
On the other side, you know, vacant property that you're in the process of redeveloping. Um, Marbledale needs a little boost, and we think this will give it that boost. And I'm not doing it as a not-for-profit. I think it'll be a very successful hotel. You know, it'll service the community on weekends and the college and Concordia and Sarah Lawrence. And during the week, there's a lot of business people here, and there's a definite need for them to stay in a nice hotel in a nice village. And what was the thinking behind the uh, the restaurant and putting the restaurant there? In all the research we did, and we had an actual restaurant consulting company come in. They spoke to the mayor. And people in Westchester don't tend to go to restaurants in hotels. Adjacent to hotels, they get the benefit of having the people in the hotel as someone to service. And it's a regular restaurant. So it services the community at large and the surrounding communities. And have you um, selected a, a partner to operate the restaurant at this point? No, but we're looking for an upscale restaurant, not fast food, something that will really make the hotel a better hotel and service the business-type customers who will come there and the families who will stay there on weekends. I'm good for now, I think. Those are great questions. Just stay, uh, sir. Is there any of the members that have any questions for the owner? Um, all right, I'm going to key you off of um, a little bit of what uh, was asked by members. God's will ask you to stay there. Um, we talked in the work session about tax credits. We know everyone goes for tax credits. Uh, some residents or specific residents asked me, will those tax credits affect, affect the tax base of this village and the schools? No, we have three different types of tax credits. Westchester County IDA was very anxious to see a hotel that can be a spot for tourists and business people to stay, so they gave us $1.2 million in sales tax credits, which don't affect the village at all, and the purchase of what's called FF&E, basically the fixtures and the outfitting of the hotel and the construction equipment, and they gave us a mortgage tax exemption, all of which went to the state. We have the hotel property designated in the New York State Brownfield program and whatever money we use to clean up the site, which only helps Tuckahoe and the environs and the neighbors, we get a direct tax credit on our federal income taxes. And if we don't owe as much as the credit is, they actually write us a check. And that comes from the federal government. So it impacts everyone because it's all our tax dollars, but it doesn't impact any Tuckahoe Village dollars per se, and it doesn't impact anyone in Tuckahoe. It's just part of the whole federal and state budgets. You mentioned brownfields. Um, so, Councillor, can you, can you approach the podium? Sure. Uh, Ms. Weinberg, can you please stay there? Can you explain to us what a brownfield is? Explain to the public? Um, this is potentially hazardous, uh, a potentially hazardous site uh, based upon the history of the uh, location. Uh, it's my understanding that the village had dumped ash. This is part of the original Tuckahoe Quarry, had dumped ash there over the years. Um, I was not involved in the uh, Brownfield uh, negotiations or the uh, contract. Mr. Weinberg handled that himself. Um, but I understand this is something that's closely regulated by the DEC, DEP, and all the other state regulations, uh, regulatory uh, authorities, rather. And any soil that is disturbed has to be removed under precise guidelines. And that soil that is not disturbed is eventually capped to make the uh, site completely free of any toxic or hazardous materials. And just stay where you are. I'm going to ask our counsel and uh, our, uh, our advisor, Mr. Fish, to, do you concur with what has been said as far as the brownfields and the capping? Yes, I can, uh, I can address it. Um, we've worked on several brownfields before, one particular uh, in Peekskill, and I think that's a fairly accurate description, DEC is uh, Department of Environmental Conservation has authority here over the brownfields. So they're going to, to qualify for the credits and to, they've already qualified, but to maintain their status for the credits, they're gonna have to do 
a cleanup here that meets the DEC standards. So the DEC is is the state DEC? State Department of Environmental Conservation. Right. Yeah, I remember uh, in the uh, in the lot at. Uh, the uh, field um, across from Lord and Taylor, name escapes me right now, but uh, that the capping was something. That's the first time I heard of capping. And I know that, uh, you know, residents over time have been concerned about the potential of, of um, hazardous uh, fumes easing out of the site, slowly working their way out of the dirt. So uh, based on what I'm hearing and learning that the capping then would limit that, if not eliminate it, and would reduce, if I'm correct in saying what I'm saying, reduce the, the current situation, which many people uh, have felt that, you know, is, is, is a hazard to the houses up on the back. So if this site, this project does go forward and the, the capping occurs in the way that the state requires, then we would be reducing the environmental danger to Tuckahoe based on what I've learned over you know the last couple of months um, and everyone seems to concur and and of course if you know the higher authority is the state so if the state's on board then then I think that uh, people's fears and which we've heard for you know, I'm here 25 years and I've heard people come to the microphone and, and express their concerns about it and you know what could anybody do so we have the situation. Right, let's go back to this tax. Uh, you know, the, the, the tax thing is something that uh, members or, or uh, members of the community that have followed this zoning board. We, uh, you know, we were always concerned about project and the impact on the schools. Very briefly, my understanding is that when a house is built, the cost of the schools versus the taxes that are paid uh, by that particular house generally don't cover the cost of the schools if there are you know, the amount of children projected in that house. We recently approved a project in Crestwood, which was a little controversial, but the numbers really worked out um, on the school system, meaning that we had one-bedroom units and they were still paying the full boat in school taxes. And in all likelihood, no one can ever be 100 percent certain that the school attendance, the drain on the school, would be minimal and uh, you know some people said that the one bedrooms people might put one kid in and the mother family could sleep in the living room and that's entirely possible but uh, the way I see this I mean this hotel pays school taxes does anyone disagree with that okay so this hotel is going to pay school taxes I believe based on what I see that this hotel is not going to house students does anyone think I'm wrong about that Okay, so zero students. Zero students. Do we have any idea of what the school tax might be? Does anyone have a number? No, we don't have that figure. For All right. Can we get that for the next meeting for me? Is a projection from somewhere? As I know, we got it projected on uh, on Crestwood. I would just like to know for the public to know, because I think it's critical. It's important, uh, and it, it's a major factor in 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 my decision. Um, okay. One more thing that I wanted to. Okay, let me just uh, deal with one thing. I, I did uh, work for a highly reputable car service company in this community for three years. And, you know, I lived there for 25 years. And what I found was via the, the exposure that I had through this car service company was that Concordia College and Sarah Lawrence College, as you mentioned, have a tremendous tremendous need for hotel bigger than ever I could ever imagine and I don't think anyone in this village really realizes it to the point where they would fill up the hotels in Yonkers they would fill up the hotels in New Rochelle and literally this car service company would be shuttling dozens and dozens of people to Elmsford to handle the demand that these top quality colleges that are in our community have Ray Kelly I believe was just speaking here he drew a tremendous crowd people want to come to this community to visit these schools and uh, they need a place to stay and uh, you know as a resident of 25 years in Tuckahoe I say yeah it'd be great if they could stay here any other questions uh, yeah I have a few more questions for uh, mr. Weinberg um, you said you haven't developed uh, hotel properties before could you talk a little bit about your um, uh, experience in developing large-scale projects like this and then the um, the second thing that uh, kind of goes along with this 
is how certain are these plans? One thing that we've struggled with as a board is we've given variances and special use permits to some high profile projects and then they sit vacant and dormant for, for years at a time before construction starts. And, um, uh, you know, we, how long do you think it would take once you get all the, the village uh, approvals, you know, which includes zoning and planning board till we get a shovel in the ground until this project uh, actually has people going in and out of the hotel. Okay, my development background, I've developed the Walmart in the state of Connecticut, the Bed Bath & Beyond Center on Central Avenue in Yonkers, ultra high luxury residential on the Larchmont border of Scarsdale, um, car dealerships, you know, just about anything, whatever it was the right fit for that property, I've developed it. Always started and finished my developments on time. We have a lot of money invested in here. We've bought the land. We've paid for architecture and countless studies that I've mentioned prior. So we're fully vested. The penalty for not building the hotel after paying for the license with Marriott is very, very high. <laughs> they don't want to see their time wasted. So we basically, I have to sign personally and guarantee that this hotel, if approved by the village, will be built. And if not, there's a huge, huge penalty that I have to pay. And Marriott's very professional. They're going to make sure I did it. I had to personally guarantee that. So once we get approved, depending on the month of the year it is, if it's December, we might not be able to start with ground or site work. But we really want to break ground right away. We're paying for you know all these services, consultants, et cetera. So we need to get in the ground. And once you're in the ground, it's is it six months, twelve months, eighteen months? What's on the outside? Eighteen months. And what's the overall budget for this project, including 20, buying the land and everything? Twenty million dollars. Any other questions? It's a real number. Yes. About Member the super, um, the ruling regarding waiving the variance secret requirement uh, is the DEC the one that signs off on whether or not they have met the standard well there's two uh, two standards one is you were talking about earlier the brownfield uh, tax credit that he has applied for and understand that he has those come with criteria that standards that DEC has set that have to be met for this site. So that's one set of standards at the state level. The second standard that applies to all of us here in Tucka, all of the boards, is that each board must comply with something called the State Environmental Quality Review Act, um, or we call it SEEKER for short. Uh, and the board's used to that, and the planning board's used to that. Uh, in this particular case, uh, I, I've given you a memo which highlights that for these area variances, the two variances they're asking for, these are exempt from seeker. It doesn't mean that village will not be doing seeker and the applicant will have to do seeker, but it means that the planning board who has the site plan authority would be the lead agency in this case. It's called the lead agency. What is What agency, what board takes the lead? they would be the ones responsible locally uh, because they have site plan approval uh, and that's not exempt from seeker. So they will have to review uh, what's called a phase one and phase two. The phase one's a literature search of this site, what contaminants were there historically, and then a phase two is very site specific to the site. What, what are the conditions of the site? Planning board's done that before uh, several times on other sites. So that would have to be reviewed. But for this board specifically, um, area variances are exempt from seeker. So as a board, uh, you can defer to the planning board on the seeker question locally. Any other questions? I, I'm going to just ask you to stay there. Um, and one of the things that I've learned uh, as a zoning board member <clears throat> is that the, the, the reason for the zoning board is for a true feeling from the public that the zoning board, and, and I've read this in many uh, decisions uh, by uh, judges, and the, uh, the judges give tremendous uh, 
weight to zoning boards on their decisions because we're the people on the ground. We talk to people. We hear things. And there has been discussion in this community and concern about uh, you know, the potential failure of this property. Um, and there was people that are concerned that if this property were not to be financially successful, it is a big step for Little Tuckahoe. No one is going to, you know, uh, dismiss it. It's, it's a major step and, uh, you know, can a three-quarter uh, square mile community really provide the necessary uh, economic uh, viability for something like this? People have their doubts. This community, this village, in my 25 years, has stepped up to the plate. There's been questions in in in, in past as to whether uh, major projects and the, the Davis uh, Revlon one is one that comes to mind. Uh, could it survive? People didn't believe it, and if it failed, uh, you know, it might turn into an, a, a property that would become undesirable. And uh, this is something that uh, the public has you know, asked in a private manners to members of this board. And I just want to uh, reaffirm that this is something that we're concerned about. And, uh, you know, what is the success rate of uh, Marriott on, on issues like this? So Marriott Spring Hill Suites has 300 operating successful Spring Hill Suites. They've never had a single failure. They have 99 more opening that are in the ground and will be open shortly. Marriott does a second study in addition to the HVS, the most respected hotel study people that I commissioned to make sure that this hotel is going to be successful. Then I brought in, you know, one of the top hotel executives that used to work for Lowe's Tisch Hotels. He was president of Lowe's Tisch Hotels and he also verified that it would work. And there's no way that I'm going to invest $20 million in a project that's not going to make it. It's uh, making Tuckahoe the central location. That doesn't mean that people who are doing business in Scarsdale and Bronxville and even at PepsiCo and MasterCard are not going to use this hotel. And when people are having a wedding at Lake Isle, it means that their guests, even though they're not in Tuckahoe proper, will come and stay here. We had a study that predicts a minimum occupancy of 73%. And for a hotel like this to be built, you need to be above the 60% range. So we're very comfortable in that. And the company that does the study leaves a lot of slack in there. We've checked the occupancy at the two hotels that are over by the Yonkers Executive Park, which are certainly off the beaten path, probably more remote than this location. You're right, I couldn't even find one once. So yes. Was, yeah, yeah. Not only are those, and a Kansas City company developed them both, not only are they above 80% at a higher room rate that we're going to charge, but they're building a third hotel. They just bought a piece of property from Robert Martin in the same location that's totally inaccessible, except for the Sawmill River Parkway, which is not the best parkway to be at. We're centrally located, if you, as you know Tuckahoe very well, between the Cross Westchester, the Cross County, the Bronx River, 87, 95, Tuckahoe's right smack in the center of each. And it used to be that hotels had to be located visibly from a highway or a parkway, but now with GPS, we're the go-to location in between all those main routes in Westchester, and we're right smack in the center. So someday Tuckahoe will have to change that on the uh, symbol and, and put a, a, map, a map with a a dot in it. We're really great, in a great geographic location. And the hotels in Nourishell, which certainly doesn't offer the safe, serene, pleasant community that Tuckahoe does, are also in those 80% ranges and doing extremely well. And there's not many of them. So we've, you know, done this. We've looked at Marriott's inside numbers. We know what all the hotels are doing, and this was a well-thought-out project, five years in the making. Well, I appreciate uh, the research, and uh, as I said before, that, you know, it was, it was quite a while ago that uh, the Revlon building of this high-end uh, apartment complex was proposed, and 
back then it was really questionable as to whether people would be uh, you know paying twenty five hundred dollars a month, which maybe today isn't crazy money, but back then it seemed like it. It was before a wonderful Main Street development, and uh, it survives, and it's uh, clearly a success, and it has shown that it is a success for uh, this uh, community, and uh, you know can help. In every well, way, we're very concerned as board about supporting the businesses, making sure that uh, our businesses survive. We realize the fact that uh, you know, without our business tax base, this small little village, you know, could just get dissolved and I mean financially just go into a black hole. And um, you know, this appears to be something that uh, could only work with the businesses, from my perspective. I mean, I'm, I've yet to hear anything otherwise. Are there any other questions for the owner? Uh, from the board members. I'm going to ask the uh, attorney to come back to the podium, please. Do we have any more um, official zoning business that you need to uh, address us to before we open the public hearing? Uh, but for the five-prong test, no. Um, do we have the five-prong test in a brief bin or uh, that you'd like to present or in paperwork? What would you like to how would I you was going to verbally present it. Uh, as I understand, the meeting will be held over until next month. If the board prefers, I will be happy to submit a written memorandum. Is, does the board need to hear the five-prong test from the from? Or, no, if so we, we've heard it written. before. We learn it very distinctly, um, um, and uh, so what I would I, I would uh, be comfortable with you submitting it in paper. We we are going to hold over. We're going to keep the we're going to open the public hearing tonight. We're going to keep it open due to the fact that it is a summer meeting. People may be away, and we want to make sure we hear everyone, everyone's opinions that uh, you know we need to hear. Um, so I would be comfortable if you submit that in paperwork to uh, the building department and the uh, legal department, so they can review it. And if they have issues with it, we can deal with it next month. So I'm I'm good with that. Um, and then I have nothing further to add. Mr. Any questions for the attorney? Uh, from no. them? Anything from the legal department that, that want to come in on? Uh, no, I th everything? think we're good. I think, you know, the board needs to, before the board, it's the two area variances. Um, there's a five-prong test that you have to apply to those area variances. Council said he's going to brief those for you, so by the next time you'll have the brief on those, and I know you've done it before. Um, we've already addressed Seeker. Mr. Fish addressed Seeker, so I think we're, we're, we're fine. So, with again, that. just to review the secret, it's not being eliminated. It's just something that doesn't come before this board. So the planning board will be right. yeah, the planning board will be dealing with this. So the public Absolutely. knows that there's still a secret uh, variance. I'm not sure what the proper term is, that uh, or approval, but it won't, it's not something that's for the zoning board. It's for the planning board. Negative deck. That's what it is. Thank you, member. Um, so okay. So we can uh, and and what I just want to say to the owner and to to council, is that I would like to do a site visit on the entire property. As I said, I've walked it numerous times in the front, but I would like to put my feet on the ground, you know, before I make my final decisions. And that what we're going to try and do is arrange for the September meeting uh, before the work session to meet at the property for the members and we can, you know, walk around and, and, and look a little closer to that rock wall and, and get a little better feeling if that's okay with everyone. I'll provide the village attorney with the contact information. They can contact uh, Mr. Weinberg directly uh, to make Whatever, whatever's convenient for the board. Okay. Then we can notice the workshop uh, session down there on the site visit. Okay, great. All right, perfect. I think that's the, the way to thoroughly vet this. Uh, it, it is a big project. It is a, it is a big jump. It is a, even though the variances are minimal, it's something that uh, I know uh, this board is, is concerned about and wants to get uh, you know, a feeling for every bit of it. So we appreciate uh, the applicant working with us and, and understanding and the you know, that we need a little bit more time on this one, if that's okay. All right, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. So what I'm going to do now is I am going to make a motion to open the public hearing on 109 Marbledale Road. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, the public hearing is now opened. If anyone at the public wishes to speak uh, on this property, they can raise their hands and I'll call upon them. Uh, let's... Aye. Which one? We got a lot of okay. Clive, Mr. you want to come up? Clive, you want to come up? Yeah, that'd be good. Come on up, Clive. Okay. Thank you. For Evelyn. That. 
Uh, my name is Clive Griffiths. I am the office manager for Key Martial Arts, 125 Marbordale Avenue. Uh, prior to this meeting, I was made aware by the council that you, this board really cannot address my questions. But since Member Scalzo touched base on it, I'm going to go ahead and proceed. Uh, a, a I, let me just of, stop you. Let me just, mm -hmm. I just want to make sure the public understands because it, 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 there's no confusion. We had an application from the same address, mm -hmm. which was the property below you. You are currently the tenant that is upstairs, upstairs. in, in the building. So this right. has nothing this to do. Nothing to do with downstairs. All right. I just yes, want and, the public. And I'm aware of that. Okay. I want the uh, public to be aware of it. That's like right. I said, I have a series of questions, but I'm just going to limit them to just two because they're very important to us and many of the surrounding businesses that's in the area. Uh, first being is the parking, uh, which is initially right now an issue. Uh, currently, we have about 166, 166 feet of parking. With the construction of the uh, hotel, uh, we're going to lose about 46 feet of parking in that immediate area around our facility. Um, that's one of our concerns. Next concern is during the project phase, we have about 80% of our clients here that are kids, three years old to about 15 years old. And our concern is the safety of our kids. And when this project starts, uh, location of equipment, location of vehicles, construction of vehicles, so forth and so on, how will that impact us and our kids in that area? Those are our concerns. Thank you. Um, you can stay there. Um, Member Scalzo, is there anything you can add to this? No, I, I think it's worth uh, investigating, thinking about. Uh, I don't know if the. Uh um, you know. any other member want to say something about it before I wait? Um, we can, that's kind of difficult for us to address some of those uh, ones, Joey. I'm sure that the concerns about safety and construction are all addressed mm -hmm. by the governance of the village in terms of what is required for right. safety. So I don't think, I would be <laughs> very surprised if that would be of concern to you. Well, what, what happens is, I think the first question regarding the parking and losing the parking, that, right. that's going to be a site plan issue, and that's going to be brought before the planning board. So right, that's what we discussed yeah, earlier. Those, right. are, mm -hmm. those are issues that need to be addressed uh, with, with that at, board. at that board. Okay. Um, with regard to the building of the project and the safety, that's going to be oversaw by Mr. Williams. So he's going to make sure, correct, Mr. Williams, you're just going to make sure the project is yeah. safe to the neighbors and, right. and moves forward, forward in a safe way. Like I said, yeah. we're concerned about the kids. We have many kids that... Uh, you have a good I'm building facility, inspector so. sitting back there. So. Okay, All but right. let me ask you straight up. I mean, sure. in your general opinion of of the project, and I mean. Oh no, I I think uh, I'm also a contractor myself, and listening to the conversation that was had earlier, and now I think they're doing a great job. But how do you think? Of, what do you think of how would it affect your business once it's completed? If it were to be passed, and if it were to be passed by the planning board, and if all the rules and everything were to be done, and it was constructed in a way that, uh, you know, didn't issue any safety to you, the parking issue is something that is obviously complicated, but do you think that people coming here, some of which live in Bronxville, who may not come to Marbledale for another reason before, do you think them coming to this hotel, maybe they're going to have family there for a wedding or something that was mentioned, do you think that the increased activity from people outside of our community would be beneficial to your business? Oh, absolutely. Without, 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 definitely so, because uh, the more people around, the more opportunity we have of influx of more clients. Um, so I think it's definitely good for the community, and it would also be good for our business. Chianti's down the block, the brewer down the block. It's, it's going to be good for every business that's there because it's just an influx of more individuals. So it can only help. Uh, for us, the only negative is lack of parking. I see. Because uh, we don't have a parking facility like they have. So we're trying to minimize the parking that we have there from losing as much of that as possible. That's that's our major concern. Members council? Right? And once again, the safety of the kids once the construction starts, because you know there's going to be a lot of heavy equipment around. So those are our two biggest issues. All right? That's great. Um, thank you, Clive. Um, I, will, I will say, you know, um, uh, we didn't address any any points around traffic uh, with this project, um, and I know safety at, at Key Martial Arts is always uh, on top of their mind. But um, there's obviously going to be increased traffic, and I can imagine that at that corner, um, eventually we may need a traffic light there, and so that'll have to be studied and figured out by the building department. And everyone, yeah. Also, one other thing: the um, we received the um, I think. The board and Mr. Williams received a letter from Mr. Marin, who's representing uh, oh, right. Key Martial Arts. So 
So I just want to make that clear that I think he reiterated what the speaker had said, so we could just make that letter part of the record. I could provide that to the uh, the applicant. Right. We we have that. Does every member have that? Yes, we do have a, a, a letter from the attorney, Mr. Marin, representing them, and we are going to receive and file that as a board. And uh, I think that's all we need. Okay, and part of the record, right. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, yes. Yes. In, re in response, um, I have issues with uh, the letter sent by uh, Mr. Marin uh, on behalf of Key Martial Arts, but I believe that the issues presented in that letter are more properly addressed by the planning board, so I reserve the right to respond at a later date at another public hearing. Okay, thank you. Mr. Marinello, please come to the microphone. Good evening. My name is Joe Marinello, um, lifelong resident of this village for the last 84 years. I just want to reminisce on one thing. Mr. Weinberg, I think it was his, was that, I don't think he remembers me, but I sat with him at a wedding and it was for one of his employees. The employee's name was Marco Del Nero, who passed on. I have no qualms with AMHAC and what he wants to do, but I'm definitely, definitely dead set against this project. First of all, Ron, in all due respect, I think your mind is already made up on this whole project. That's my opinion for what I've seen tonight listening to you on television home. Gentleman to the right, I don't know him from Adam, but I will like to congratulate him on the questions he asks. I wish the other two members would just heed me for a minute. I live directly above that quarry. 1952, actually most closer to 53, when I got off the train here in Tuckahoe and I walked down Columbus Avenue with my duffel bag on my shoulders. I walked down in Circuit Avenue. I made my right hand turn. I was going where I was born on 58 Circuit Avenue. The stench and stink and horrible smell I heard. I couldn't believe what I was smelling. When I got home, my family was very excited to see me home. I served my country, came home from the Korean War, so it was good to be home. But after I had an opportunity, I spoke to my dad. I said to him, what is that stink? It's the quarry. I said, what are you doing about it? He said, we can't do anything. They told us to keep our mouth shut. Well, I loved my father, but I disobeyed him. From 1952 to present, I fought. I fought the horrible experiences we lived here in the village of Tuckahoe with the filth, with the filth and the contaminations that were dumped in that beautiful quarry. And I hate to tell you, but one of my neighbors up the street from me had mentioned to the village board and the mayor at the time, she was concerned about a cluster well, I lost my mother and two of my sisters from cancer. And I lost another whole family, the DeBellos, five of them, and the Dorenzos. I can name you, name you, name you, the people that died. I don't know if it all came from that quarry. I had no idea. But that quarry had a lot to do with everybody getting so sick up there. Right now, I have a beautiful wife home with Alzheimer's and Parkinson. And she's not going into a minute nursing home. Not in the 50 years I'm married, 59 years I'm married to her, so I'm taking care of her. So I had to make special arrangements to have somebody come, sit there while I came here and told you that this is the biggest, the most dangerous project that this village has ever undertaken. It's way above a lot of our heads. I think I mentioned it to you, Ron. In Mamaronek, the they had a hotel. Hartsdale, they had a hotel. Didn't, didn't swing. Became homeless shelters. Became prostitute havens. Drug infested. Took my Maronic years to get rid of that blight. 
Don't bring that to the village of Tuckahoe. This hotel doesn't make it, and I believe this gentleman, I know he's in business, he thinks it might swing with Concordia and Lawrence uh, College. But let me tell you something, he might not know it, but they're building right now a tremendous hotel in Yonkers that's going to take care of the needs of Lawrence and Concordia. Concordia wants this college so bad, let them build it in Bronxville. They had a hotel there that's gone. You might not know about it, Ron, but there was a beautiful hotel. It was called the Gramerton Hotel in Bronxville. It's not there. Listen, I've been watching the board meetings and these meetings. The two words I want to express to you tonight is apathy and complacency. You don't see the village like they used to come in throngs to these meetings, especially a project like this. Nobody from my area. But God forbid those people on Chestnut, Circuit, Limekill, Rogers, Coolidge, where I live, Farragut, Hollywood Avenue. Those people are all going to be affected by this project. We're right now listed with the state as being the highest density village in this New York State. Now, with these other projects that we have on board, Crestwood, Midland Avenue, Jefferson, possibly Main Street, could you imagine the traffic and people? We were able to walk down the street here on Columbus Avenue, and we knew most of the people that walked by us. Ron and anybody sitting on that board, you can't tell me you could do that today because it, you can't. It's a transit community. This hotel is going to be a problem. The one thing that makes my heart cry with joy is to know that thy quarry will finally be filled and cleaned which it should have been done way back in 52. But we had the political system working. We had a former mayor, Gibbons, who was a cop, who was very involved with that quarry. Mayor Uvino was another. Now, your developer mentioned Mayor Fitzpatrick. Now I know where this hotel dream came in his mind and head. It was from his meeting with this gentleman. It wasn't a public meeting that I'm aware of. It was a private meeting, probably a nice dinner somewhere. Well, Ron, I'm going to tell you, I don't like those backdoor deals. I never did. I was a police commissioner of this village for 25 years. I served from 1960 to 85. And I went to bed every night with a clear head because I did what I was supposed to do. I'm telling you and I'm telling the village of Tuckahoe to wake up. This project is immense. If it fails, we're stuck. So I'm very concerned about it. I'm concerned about the traffic. I'm concerned about a lot of other things. But I'm concerned about the prostitution and the drugs. And I'm concerned about this place being a housing spot for the county or for somebody else. I'm afraid of that. It bothers me. So you got to do me a favor. you got to really think this out. And when he said five stories, well, I went to my backyard today. It's above my backyard. It's above my backyard. And I still don't know what's going to go on top of that roof, the air conditioning and whatever. So five stories to me is crazy always has been. So I don't know how much more I could tell you, but my heart says this village is making a horrible mistake. Horrible. Something that will never, ever, ever be forgiven by the people who are lifelong residents like me. I'm just so concerned about a project this big, and we don't know that much about it, so we got a long ways to go before this is final, finalized, I presume. So I'm willing to sit back home 
and watch the proceedings as they go forward. But you know what? I have big doubts. My only question, Mr. Chairman, is if you're able to ask the developer. That property was owned by Slotnick. Does Slotnick still own that property, or does Mr. Weinberg own it? I'd like to know who the owners of that property are right now. Do you know? Why are you afraid to tell me? Why are you? Uh, it, 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 was, okay, I'm sorry. Wasn't it mentioned, uh, Mr. Weinberg mentioned that he bought the property. He owned, you're now the current owner, correct? Uh, you did say that before. Okay. He's the owner of he said he actually owns the, owner the property. Of the property. Yeah. So he actually bought it off Slotnick. Mistaken. That's what he said before. Slotnick does not have that property. Right. Okay. Ask the uh, gentleman. He says he owns it. Okay, Just, finally. Thank you. Thank you, because... I'd like to hear from Gary, yeah, Joe, if that's okay. The board uh, application and the application to come here, um, Mr. Weinberg uh, said that Bill Wynn Development is the owner of the property, and that was notarized and sworn to. So he's the owner, Jerry? Yeah. Okay. Yes. And I I'm, actually I'm, that with Now you. I'm satisfied because Mr. Slotnick filed a lawsuit against the village and actually lost. That made me very happy because we lived with a horrible situation down there. One last thing, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. The property directly across the street, which is now, and I see the gentleman there, is owned by the, uh, I forgot the name of the family, but the auto body shop owner is back there. And he was in Mr. Denning's previous spot. Yes. And by the way, I congratulated him for being a good neighbor when he was down in that spot. I agree. But that property directly across the street, okay, as you remember, was called Freedman Industries. Yes. It was owned by two brothers, Joel and his brother, no, I mean, Park, I think it was his name. That was cleaned up by the EPA at a cost of $3 million that they refused to pay. I happened to be working at the Gannett newspapers. That's my full-time job. I was there for almost 40 years. I attended those federal trials. I was interested in the outcome. They were found guilty, and they paid for that cleanup. You're talking about a tremendous, tremendous, long, deep quarry. Well, Mr. Dunning's building right now was owned by a chemical company called Lee Oil and Chemical that blew horrible chemicals in there. And Burroughs Welcome, now known as Smith Klein, multi-billion dollar organization that put more deadly chemicals in that quarry than God knows. So, Ron, when you sit there and think this is a great project, just remember one thing. There might be a lot of us sitting home that don't agree with you. Okay. I hate to put you on a spot. You're not putting me on a spot, Joe. This is what this is all about. But before I address Mr. Marinello, is there any board members that would like to say something? I no, I would, I would just say, Joe, obviously we're trying to do this in the most transparent, uh, fair, straightforward way, which is um, uh, clearly the reason why we're having this meeting, why we're holding it over to the next meeting, and, and as well as the planning board will also have open meetings as well. Because um, the reality is this is the first time that we're seeing this project, and so we're just trying to get the facts uh, understood so at least everyone knows the facts and then um, and also get a sense of the community as to what they want to do so that's what this process is about um, and we're just trying to work through that so we, we really appreciate you coming and um, everyone that speaks it's it's very much appreciated I thank you for your time I hope I didn't stay there Mr. Marino. anybody it's not my intention no, no, it's okay. is any to other, insult anybody any other I just want to bring facts out okay is there any other members that have a question for for the, Mr. Marinello before no, I okay just, I just hope he realizes that um, we're uh, here to approve uh, variances okay this project is an approved project you know on the zoning of it and, uh, do you understand what I'm saying I in other words, exactly hotel, what the use, saying. hotel use is an approved use. That's the thing. I understand that. And it was done by uh, whatever the mayor. Wait a while. He made a statement. He had a conversation and meetings with the former mayor. But that's fine. It's Patrick. That's, that's and so that's when this thing was rezoned and everything else was done. That bothers me. It bothers me a lot. Okay. To know that. 
Joe, Joe. Here at a public okay. meeting, it's been stated that Mr. Fitzpatrick and the, and the developer I, had meetings and ideas and talked Joe. about what was good. By the way, don't cut me off, Ron. I'm not trying to cut you off. Last Joe. thing I want to say about that is that the buffer zone for us residents on Chestnut and all that strip down to Hollywood was 150 feet from the residential to the industrial zone. What has that been changed to? Can you uh, tell me? It's Frank 20 Fish, feet. Anybody? 20, 20 feet, I believe. I'm going to have to check the zoning on that. I'll have to check for you. I think the mayor and his board at that I, time changed. Wait a while, Ron. Joe. They changed it to, I think, 50 feet. Okay. Which is a big difference from 150 to 50. Joe. I understand, Ron. No, I, no. I, I understand. Is there something, it's a point that I really want to make, and I made this at a prior meeting. This is a small village. And can everybody. Tell me something I don't know for 84 years. Joe, can I make my point? Go ahead. Please. This is a small village. And one of the benefits of this village is everybody knows everybody. And one of the negatives is everybody knows everybody. And I had said this to a, to a prior uh, person who came up with a. a I really want to keep the personalities and the names out of it. I don't feel it's necessary. This, let me just make, you, you spoke for a while. I believe, and I believe I'm correct, that the zoning change was noticed, that there was a public hearing on it, that it was discussed. Whether the idea comes from anywhere, and, 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 and in my opinion, any particular mayor meeting with proposed businesses that you know have a viability idea i think that's good and welcome and then it's up to the elected officials to hash it out and figure out whether they believe they are the elected officials that it is in the best interest in their opinion and they're you know and and you can vote them out of office that's how our system works if you disagree with their changes and and you feel that they're wrong we we have a ballot box here we have a two-year ballot box here which is you know really gives the public the Tremendous opportunity to voice their opposition and throw the bums out, so to speak, to use a cliche, and someone else comes in. So, I appreciate what you're saying, Ron. I, I just want to set the record straight so you don't ramble on and on. I want you to know I had no intentions of mentioning the former mayor, had no intention until this gentleman mentioned his name and had meetings with him in revolve, in, involving okay. that property. So this is a public forum, you understand? Yes. It's America. Yes. Okay, and we have a right yes. to question. And I think, Ron, every meeting, every meeting should be open to the public. They are. And, and, and well, obviously, those meetings weren't. Okay, Joe, we okay. I, I, I can't speak to them. But some of the things that just so you know, what we did in our work sessions, we kept it very short and simple. Sometimes in work sessions on more simple projects, we'll spend a half an hour, 45 minutes, maybe an hour on that project to determine whether we're going to approve it and, and either approve it or, 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 or turn it down and move on. This is something that I expressed to this board and to these applicants and to, and to our officials that I wanted to do as little talking about this project in the work session. Everything that you've seen here that we're talking amongst each other is, is, is real. It, it, we didn't go over everything ahead of time. We actually wanted to come here and talk about it amongst ourselves and ask questions that were not asked in the work session so that the public could hear and we want that to be. But here's where I want to go with you on this, Joe. What, it, and you had sent a letter that said you were against the project, and that's fine. What the board, the, the zoning board does, we don't take a poll. We don't say, okay, 34 people are against it and 33 are in favor of it, and therefore we're going to turn it down, or vice versa. That's not what it is. What we try to determine and what we've learned you know, by the state zoning laws is, is the detriment to the village greater than the benefit to the applicant? Is the village, and that's where we're weighing everything here, how is the village going to be hurt versus the benefit to the applicant? That is our job, and that's what we look at. And, and sometimes there's a benefit to the village, and there clearly are some benefits to the village which have been raised tonight. The environmental capping, I think, is critical. I've heard you over and over again at meetings saying about the potential danger here, and it is something that is unprovable, but I think it's a viable, 
you know, a discussion. And I've driven by this property for many, many years, and I've thought of you, and I mean this honestly, Joe, of you saying the fumes that might be coming out of here. And I remember when the, when they capped at uh, the field, um, I forget the name of the field across from Lord and Taylor, when that capping was done. And I remember thinking to myself, and this is the truth, geez, do we need to cap? Because I remember Mr. Marinello said, should that be capped? But we can't force somebody to cap something if they're not going to develop it. So now we have a development here. It's not a giant apartment building. It's not something that, that you know, could negatively impact us on, on the financial. But we have a development here which looks, let me finish, viable. And that's not our decision, and there's nothing that we really can do. But here we have one that would not be a drain on it. I mean, I, I forgot to ask my garbage question, but I would assume they're going to get outside uh, refuse. So that the drain on the taxpayers on this appears to be minimal from me, and we're going to cap this property, a property that you've been passionate about. And, you know, not everyone's coming up to any boards in the last 25 years saying, I want to develop this giant piece of land. It is a quarry. It costs a lot of money to develop this because pilings have to be driven because there's no support. It's very expensive. So it, it, we just can't you, develop this tomorrow to, to something else. Being against the property, uh, being against the project, because you believe that it's economically unviable is something that, that I, as a person who worked in the, in, the, in, the, in the newspaper business, I don't think that you're really qualified, to be honest with you, and I mean that in all due respect, to say that this hotel is going to fail because you worked in the newspaper business for 40 years. As I said before, many, many people said that Davis was going to fail, and it was believable then because rents in, the, in this village were 1000 bucks a month. How the heck is a guy going to survive at 2500 a month? And there was a lot of questions Mr. about Gallo, that, and he had, survived. You had no way of telling me why Bronxville, who had a gorgeous hotel up there, was called Gramerton Hotel. I remember it vaguely when Gone. I moved here. Okay. Why? Okay. I can't answer that question. One last question for the attorney. When we get the results on the environmental, the, the, the borings that were done, because I'm very aware of the borings that, that they were dug down there about a year and a half ago, when we get those results on the toxins and, and everything else about that, do we get copies of that? Does that the village, does the village residents know about it? We'll, we'll advise the planning board as we've done previously here. And in fact, we don't have a choice. They will be public. The answer to your question is yes, you'll have the right to see everything that's produced for the planning board. The planning board will act as lead agency for the local environmental review. They'll get what's called a phase one environmental and a phase two, which will be those boards. Results. Anything that DEC has or the applicant has that submits to the planning board uh, will be public, so you'll have access to that. So Frank, his representatives will explain the testing and whatnot, and then the village will hire our own? Is that what, is that what happens? Is that what happens, Frank? Yeah, uh, yes, you'll, you'll, okay. you'll be able to have access to that at the planning board level. Ron, I apologize if I came over too strong. It's not my nature, but on projects like this, I am strong and I'm adamantly against a hotel on Marbledale Road. And you've known that. I've said that publicly when they rezone that property. So it's nothing new that I'm doing here tonight. What would you like to see there, Joe? I would like to see the quarry the way it was when I was a little boy. How's that? The same quarry that's down where the mayor lives on Young Street. How's that? That quarry is why we're here today. I know. But you and no one else will tell me why the fathers of this village decided to do what they did. It was wrong then, and it's wrong now, and it took until 1952 to this day to prove me right. That's a long time. Thank you thank for you. you thank you. Joe, I have the greatest respect for you. I, I think you know. Thank you. Is there any comments? I, I would just make a, one comment uh, for Mr. Weinberg or, or Mr. Salerno. Um, obviously, the economic viability of this project is, um, is key in everyone's mind, and mis you heard Mr. Marinello. Uh, Marinello talk about it. Um, you indicated that you'd done a several different studies uh, with HVS and potentially with Marriott doing a secondary study showing why that this hotel in this location at 163 rooms 
isn't too large that it's mostly vacant and it isn't too small where you don't get enough income to justify your expense um, and why it will uh, be profitable and good for the community and for yourself. Uh, to the extent you can make those studies um, public or put them into the record either through the zoning board or the planning board, I think that would be helpful for everyone to see. Um, that way we're not as non-qualified people just arguing uh, whether it would be successful or not. It would be interesting to see those professional studies. By counsel, we have no problem sharing those studies with the board, uh, with the uh, planning or zoning boards. However, with the utmost respect, the ultimate success of a project is not a factor for this board to consider in determining whether the variances should be granted. Thank you. Okay, public hearing is still open. Does someone like to speak? Yes, Mr. Brewery. <laughs> <laughs> no samples, huh? Yeah, good evening. Um, I just have uh, a, uh, an observation and then just one brief question. And the, and the observation would be I have no studies, uh, only anecdotal, that um, our brewery does, in fact, attract uh, quite a bit of traffic on the weekends from places as far, are people from as far away as Pennsylvania, uh, Western Connecticut, uh, upstate New York. And that's just uh, part of the brewery industry, much like the winery industry, where people will start in an area and they'll basically go brewery by brewery or winery by winery and they'll make a day or a weekend of it or what have you. Um, there have been frequent comments that there is no place to stay in the area, so they move on to another town um, and now I can't you know I have nothing to offer other than that conversation but I do believe um, not so much during the weekend or the week uh, during the week it's a very quiet town very you know very nice neighborhood uh, type area but on the weekends you do get out of towners here and there is no place to stay so I think uh, that might help the equation uh, the question I have w is just simply uh, looks like a you know, terrific project, but it is, it does border other adjacent properties. Are there any plans for, um, you know, decorative walls or any other walls between the properties that any of the other neighbors will end up being involved with or affected by? Mr. Architect? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and those uh, concrete walls, green walls, shrubbery walls of that nature? Uh, you'll have to get to the microphone, I'm sorry. Stay there, Lyle. Don't go away. We are, pro we are proposing, um, and we'll show that during the site plan review with the planning board, um, landscaping around the perimeter, particularly on that west, along the west side of the, of the uh, West site. is the back. West is the back yeah. side of the site. And throughout the parking area, there will be landscaping as well. Okay. Any questions from the board for Lyle? Uh, I do it. it. Isn't that part of the green buffer that, that they wanted the variances, right? No, the green, I think, is more like um, uh, solar or environmental, that type of thing. Those, and those. The buffer, and I'm talking about the buffer that they're That's looking for. Those are lot line buffers. Is, excuse me? Those are setbacks from the property line. No, buffer. no, not But the they're not required the to have green wear. I don't know if they're required to have Isn't green. Is there a green buffer going around? Yes, but I don't know if it's required to be green. Is what well, it's okay. Well, okay. That's the, what it's shown as. Right, right. They're doing that. I don't think it's it's something that is necessary under the zoning laws, uh, if, if I'm correct. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman, just to let you know or to let the speaker know, I can pretty much predict, uh, given the composition of the planning board, there will be great scrutiny to <laughs> the uh, details of the landscaping buffer here. So that is probably the meeting or meetings you might want to be at. No, no, I, and actually, I, I appreciate that, and uh, went through the same process a year ago, and uh, and I, I think uh, things have all turned out very nicely. I, my specific question is just as your neighbor, um, are you expecting us to get involved in any way with the project uh, in terms of the green belt? So you design part of the shrubbery, and you're on one side, and I'm on the other side, and we kind of make it look nice in an adjacent manner. Or is it just contemplated that that's part of your project and, uh, and you know, you're, you're on that side of the wall and I'm on the other side of the wall and we're just great neighbors? 
I would say that we are open to the opportunity to enhance landscaping by working together. So I welcome the opportunity to meet with you and talk about that. All right, I'll stay there. Uh, I really want to thank you for coming. I really want to thank you for giving that input of information. Uh, you know, for us, the board, and the public, to know it's something we don't realize, you know, sitting at home or coming down for a beer occasionally, that people from way outside are coming and discovering Tuckahoe because they want to try Broken Bow, Broken Bow Brewery, correct? Broken Bow Brewery. Broken Bow Brewery. I mean, and I think that, again, just adds to, you know, the, the exponential growth that different businesses bring, which are unintended and people don't realize that, here, here, here's this brewery, and there is, I mean, this was brought up when you guys came to us about the food, about the fact that there is this internet thing where people go, and I mean, we've heard of pub crawls in New York City, but you have these brewery crawls where people come all over to try different beers, and here they are coming from Pennsylvania and other places to a little village called Tucko that they would probably never come to. And the fact that they then may u utilize, uh, you know, a hotel, is, is just uh, adds to the potential for the economic viability that's been in question by Mr. Marinello. And uh, it, it's something that I didn't think of, and uh, I really appreciate uh, uh, you bringing it to light. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your time. Okay. Next, anybody from the, mem uh, from the public like to come up and speak on this issue? Anybody else? Yes, Mr. Cacciola. Seek your name and address for the... Hey, Don Rocco Cacciola. I own uh, Rocco Service Center on 181 Marble Day Road. I do auto repair service. I have over 2,000 customers. And I mentioned to a lot of my customers that the hotel is coming into town. And they're pretty excited about it. When they have customers, uh, family members coming over for weddings and parties, that they have a place to stay. Wow. So. And your customer base is where? In Tucko. Just old Tucko, or is it East No, it comes from all over. It comes from New York City, Connecticut, Long Island. Mm -hmm. Well, and so you've got nothing. Have you spoken to any of your other uh, co-owners on the, on the property, on, on, the, on the block, as to how they feel? Yeah, I spoke to a lot of neighbors nearby, and they were all excited about it. And they were all for it also. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Metaray gave me a letter that... Uh, Okay, we'll take that letter and put it into the record. <coughs> All right, thank you. It's uh, a meta rave for everyone's information is located on Marble Dell Road also, and they're signed here giving... Uh, they own four, four buildings on the block. Four buildings on the block, giving Mr. Cacciola the, the proxy to speak on behalf of them, so they're in favor of it, that's correct. I will receive and I'll make copies of this for the rest of the board to have on their files, and uh, Nancy will get this at the end, all right? Um, you don't see any negative potential problems here at all? Uh, I think it's a great idea. And is this a concern of yours and the other members of this empty land sitting there for a long time? Is it something that needs to be done? That would be a great place to you know clean everything up. And you're the owner of the property where you have now, and you... Yeah, I own three pieces right there, Mom Dale Road. And you pay taxes. I pay um, taxes. Okay, so. Plenty of taxes. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you, sir. As do we all. Anybody else from the public like to say something? Okay, uh, what I'm going to do is, as I said before, this is a special meeting in the middle of the summer, and there is a possibility that. Uh, you know, other members uh, of the community were not able to attend this because of vacations. So I'm going to make a motion to keep the public hearing open uh, until our uh, September meeting. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, the public hearing is now closed. Do we have anything that, uh, other than the fact that we're going to work on a actual site visit for September, is there any members that, that want something researched? No? So I think, uh, you know, again, just to summarize, this, uh, what I wanted to do with this meeting is, is try and have as much discussion about something as possible, even though the variances in front of this board are not that many, uh, but uh, a lot of people in this community have come up to me and other members and, and asked about it. So even though some of the questions that we discussed were not directly in front of us, 
you know, as members of the community and as members of the zoning board, which try to really stay in touch with the community and have answers. This is why maybe some of the questions and we kept you a little later than might have been necessary for our variances. But I want this board, uh, you know, to be prepared to answer any questions that we might have when we bump into uh, a neighbor or someone at the coffee shop. Um, we want we want to know everything we can. So I think it's to the to the advantage of everyone that we're you know, go a little longer than maybe was necessary. All right, is there anything else that the members want to have? Is there yeah, anything? I'd like to just reiterate, Mr. Uh, Chairman Gallo brought out before that we minimized our work session with regard to this here to make it all uh, be brought out at the uh, general meeting. And I would like for anybody who has anything to say in the village to come out. It's an open forum. And that's the whole idea of the public uh, part of the meeting. Thank you. Uh, well said uh, from our senior member, Member Palladino. Is there anything that the uh, building department or the uh, legal department need, needs to add? Mr. Fisher, is anything that you feel we've missed? Okay, great. I want to thank everyone. I, I really want to thank the uh, the board members for making the time on a month that we're uh, you know normally not having a meeting, but it's something that uh, you know we <clears throat> have learned from uh, you know the elected officials that uh, they want us to be fair and open to everybody, but they want us to recognize the cost of, uh, you know, delaying meetings and dragging things on uh, to the applicants. So we, uh, we uh, I want to thank our members again for making, uh, you know, time out of their summer schedule to come to this meeting. And uh, it's just an, uh, another showing of, 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 of the committedness that uh, these members, that I know these members have to this village and to uh, being fair. Gary, is there someone? Yeah, I just want clarification. The work sessions are open to the public. We actually That's have correct, members of the yeah. public there tonight. Yes. I just want to make that clear. Yeah. It is open. Right, but it, it is open to the public, and the public. But it's not televised. And it's not televised. But the public really doesn't have uh, the right to interact, from what I recall. They're 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 allowed to sit in, and listen to what we do. But any questions that the public has need to be on the record and on TV, not at the work sessions. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, everyone, for 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 a terrific meeting, spirited meeting. And uh, at this time, I'm going to make a motion to uh, close the zoning board meeting. Uh, do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Good night, Doc.